Well, happy Father's Day, everybody. And uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, I just want to say happy Father's Day to Darren because he is a great father. He said it to us. And, uh, and I always, um, you know, I love getting to speak here, so I always like to honor Darren, so I'll get to continue to speak here. But uh, that was really sincere. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you know that I always like to include my physician, Dr. Denny, in every uh, talk, uh, Dr. Dewey. And uh, I don't have a place for him, but I want to show you a picture. This is what happened yesterday, uh, celebrating a milestone birthday of mine. 21 of us got into a bus. This is my small group. And we went to Chicago to the Art Institute, had dinner, and then we went to see West Side Story or West Sad Story. Those people need Jesus. And uh, this is what we did. And it was the best. Honey, thank you so much for that day. I got gifts like uh, Will and Amy Hearst gave me a little uh, book on how to make little sock monkeys. And uh, it's just fabulous. Here you go, baby. And uh, my daughter's over there. But anyway, I always say, get involved in a small group. I don't think it's advertised anywhere that one of the benefits of small group is you may do field trips to other cities. You uh, may uh, attend uh, art events. And uh, you also may get a free bus ride. But I tell you, I had one of the best days and nights ever and it would have never happened if I had not been in a small group. So I'm just using that as an advertisement for small groups. Well, it is a very special day because in the heart of every child, on the lips of every child, the word father really is God. You are, dads are God to kids. And they have such an impact. In fact, even as adults, many times what we're really praying is, dear heavenly version of my earthly father. And so uh, it's important that we, if we have a crummy experience, that we resolve that because we don't want uh, the malfunction of a dad down here to interfere with our relationship with God. Now, a little girl was asked to explain, what is Father's Day? And she said, well, it's like Mother's Day, but you don't spend as much money on the presents. <laughs> I think that might be true. Uh, I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to do some typical, stereotypical uh, Father's Day humor. Here are things that you will never hear a good dad say. For instance, no son of mine is going to live under this roof without an earring. Now quit your belly aching and let's get to the mall. <laughs> You're probably not going to hear that. Um, I notice all your friends have a hostile attitude. I love that. Bring them around more often. <laughs> what do you mean you want to play football? Figure skating's the perfect sport. Um, your mother and I are going to go away this weekend. Why don't you have some friends over and have a wild party while we're away? Or, uh, honey, now that you're 13, date anyone, any age, any time. Go for it. You'll have a great time. Now, there was a guy that put together a little child-rearing plan uh, just for men, so that they can understand how to take care of an infant. It says this, do not drop unit as this may cause damage. <laughs> Stay clear of the ejection ports, both front and rear. <laughs> do not submerge unit for extended periods of time. <laughs> do not leave unit unattended in public places. Do not expose to extreme temperatures. And then make sure that proper approved restraints are in place while transporting unit. Do not use duct tape. <laughs> and uh, multiple units operating in close proximity may be hazardous to your health and mental well-being. The unit is delivered as is and may not be returned or exchanged. No warranty should be implied. Well, I love that. And, uh, you know, dads have such a major impact. Sidney Harris, I've got a lot of quotes today, but Sidney Harris, whoever he is, uh, he said that the best parenting is a combination of a dad who is gentle below his firmness and a mother who is firm below her gentleness. Boy, that really says so much. And sometimes, you know, us dads, we are firm below our firmness because we're trying to prove something or, or whatever, and uh, it really goes against good child rearing. There's a wonderful 
a gypsy proverb that just kind of says how deep the impact is of fathers. It says, you have to dig very deep to bury your father. In other words, your father really is never buried. Um, he, he's part of you. Whether he was there or not there, he lives on. And so it's important that us dads do uh, the very best job that we possibly can. Now, um, one of the, let me see where the notes take me there. I went from there to there, and then I go over here. Attention deficit disorder. Anyway, does that look like notes of an attention deficit disordered person? Do I, am I faking it? No, I'm not. Okay. Anyway, uh, we're going to study First Peter, the second part of this first chapter. And last week, Peter's such a great communicator. He starts last week with all this encouragement for the discouraged, and now... 13 through 22, he starts talking about some things that we need to do in response to God's great encouragement. And so uh, this today is all about being disciplined. And so why is it hard for us to be disciplined? And a disciplined person is a person that's in control of themselves and under the control of God. Well, one reason it's hard it's not your nature to be disciplined. In fact, according to the Myers-Briggs personality profile, 45% of us spontaneous people will never be totally disciplined in what we do. So we just, you know, we can fake it, but it goes against everything. And then the other 55, you've got this evil spirit in the world getting you to do everything other than live up to the disciplined life that you can live. Secondly, there are so many other options. 599 television channels that you can go through. Uh, it kind of puts you right there on the couch. Social media, which I call anti-social media. There's not really anything social about that coming together. And then, you know, there's food everywhere. Beer commercials. Nothing advertises better than beer. It's just unbelievable. And then you've got, well, the possibility to gossip today. You can do that. You know, maybe that's your big challenge. But we have all of these things other than being self-disciplined. And then sometimes we get so busy controlling others that we don't control ourselves. Someone said to me one time, you should have your head examined, and uh, I do. I, I go in for a checkup every year. I see a psychiatrist out at, uh, in California to make sure that I'm not under-medicated, as my wife has accused me of being. <laughs> so before I went this time, I said, honey, is there anything that I should share with the psychiatrist? She said, yes. I said, what? Tell him that you're more controlling this year. I said, I am not more controlling. And I don't like you saying that. She said, yeah, you are. Even the boys notice it. Well, you know, I, I guess I am guilty of this very thing because I would rather focus on other people and all of that than on me. That is human nature. So one of the things that we need to do is to try to focus on ourselves. Another thing that happens in, in uh, trying to have discipline is we take the wrong approach. We think trying harder is going to do it or our own power or that same thing we've been doing that's failed over and over again is going to finally produce a great result. And then number five, we end up with the wrong motivation. You know, I've struggled with weight all my life. And, and I know that if your motivation is a wedding, oh, look out after that wedding, you know. Uh, or if you're get, losing weight to go back to the class reunion, look out after the class reunion is over. I've gained that same 30 pounds back over and over again in my younger life. You know, sometimes we're motivated to earn God's favor. We can't do that. You can't do that. Come on. He's not going to look down at you and go, oh, nice job. I can elevate you. No, his grace <laughs> covers that already. So, you know, we want to, to have the right motive. And, you know, some people have no motive. They're having a good time, and they have parents that will fund it for them. And the parents say, man, my, my child has a problem. No, your child does not have a problem. You have a problem. Your child's living the, the good life, and only because you're enabling that person. So we come down to this place where last week we were talking about hope for the discouraged. This week, it's help 
for the disciplined life, we're looking at 1 Peter 1, 13 through 22, as well as we can do that on two hours of sleep. You see, the musical was over at 10.30 Chicago time, 11.30 our time. Now, you got a bus going 55 miles an hour home. You can imagine what that's like. But anyway, I'll stick with it, and uh, we'll do the best that we can. All right. So, the first thing is to clear up your thinking. Clear up your thinking. Verse 13 says, so think clearly. See how I translated that? Okay. So, here's the deal. There is... There is so much pain and struggle. Would you agree with that? So much pain and struggle in the world. So much pain and struggle in this room. Would you agree with that? That's just part of life, pain and struggle. The Bible says, hey, don't be surprised when you encounter these trials. Okay, now over here, would you agree with this? There's a lot of hope and help through God's word, the Holy Spirit, uh, through, through living a disciplined life uh, through allowing God to work through you. Would you agree there's a lot of help and hope? Okay, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is that in the middle is a tremendous amount of confusion on how we go from the hurt and the, the struggle to the help and the healing that's available. Some people would say go to a Benny Hinn uh, uh, worship thing or whatever and, and uh, be instantly healed. Well, you know, some people are instantly healed but they're not instantly delivered into character. Some people would say, you just have more faith, you could be healed. Some people say, more Bible and more prayer. That's, that's going to do it. More Bible study, more prayer. Well, I don't think that that is the way. I think that that's plan B, C, or D. I think plan A for God is you connecting with other believers and, and receiving support and help from people that love you and care about you. Sadly, we don't reach out for help because we think the shame of being known is worse than the shame of the life of sin, the double life. And I'm going to tell you something. That is not true. Once you have shared and become open with your struggle, it gets easier. Just releasing that secret makes it so much easier to deal with. So we need to think clearly. Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by changing the way that you think. So if you're not going to be willing to change the way you think, then this thing's going to go nowhere. We have to change the thinking. A lot of people think, well, you know, I've been raised right. I went to school. I went to seminary. I got it. No, you don't have it. Or you'd see it in your life. So we got to change the way that we think. Second point is exercise self-control. See, the verse says, and exercise self-control. So I interpreted that to mean exercise self-control. We are called to be (laughs) self-controlled. Restrain your impulses. Now, a lot of men struggle with anger. Why is that? Well, a father's role is to help a young man constrain his anger. So a young boy gets upset and angry. Dad pulls him in, holds him, loves him. And he comes to understand that my anger can resolve. It doesn't have to spew out into rage, into violence, into criminal activity. So many of the people in prison never had a dad that helped them constrain their anger. Our job is to pick these kids up and help them deal with the anger that is there. All right, so there was this little girl... And uh, she was convicted to come down the aisle and accept Jesus as her Savior. And so she invited Jesus into her heart. Sweet time. The family was so excited that she had Jesus living in her heart. The next day, she was praying, uh, playing with her brother after they had prayer together. She, that's what the lack of sleep does. Anyway, they were playing together, and she got frustrated and smacked her brother right upside the head. He said, whoa, I thought Jesus was living in your heart. And she said, well, right now, Jesus is asleep. (laughs) You, You can come down the aisle, but you still have to make choices that make a difference in your life. So we have to exercise self control. Uh, This week on our program, 
the uh, day, Dr. Dave Stoop, he said the most retweeted thing that's ever been said on the show. He says, you can't pray yourself out of something that you behaved yourself into. Now, just think about that. Somebody drinks for 40 years and they think they're going to have five minutes of prayer and it's all going to be over? Come on. If you've been drinking for 40 years, you're going to need 40 years of a different kind of behavior if you've you got to do some things in a different way. So I just thought it was brilliant. You can't pray yourself out of something you behaved yourself into. I believe in prayer. I believe in uh, absolute uh, miracles. But I also believe in surrendering to the process that works for whatever you're struggling with. Ravi Zacharias, brilliant man, he said this, in an attempt to be reasonable, man has become irrational. In an attempt to defy himself, he has defaced himself. In an attempt to be free, he has made himself a slave. And like Alexander the Great, has conquered the world around him, but has not changed himself. Our call is to change ourselves. One of the ways we do that is to live, if you look at number three, live looking forward. The passage says, look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So we need to look forward to that. Your past, when did your past end? It just ended one second ago. I mean, and then a second ago. And now it ended again. Your past just ended again. Over and over your past. Ended. So we don't want to be focused on the past. You know what I find? People, it's like if they were driving a car. Could they do a good job if all they looked at was the rearview mirror up there? If that's all they focused on? Do you think that that... Well, here's the problem. A lot of people, their rearview mirror is this big. And their windshield... Looking forward is about that big. And everything they do is determined about where they've been, what they've done, and their past. And Jesus wipes it out. And he doesn't want that. He wants to shrink the rear view mirror. So we have to be facing forward. Because the past ended a second ago. And the present is full of challenges. And i got to tell you, I have reached some places in my life where the only way I got through them was to think about the fact that I was saved and I was going to be teletransported uh, to heaven one day and I was going to live for eternity with God. That's the only thing that got me up in the morning and going is that I will get through this, I will live another day, and I will experience that great gift that God has promised to me and all of his children. So we need to live looking forward. Now, here's a tough one. Number four, obey God. Verse 14 says, you must live as God's obedient children. Now, I told you I had a weight problem. There were two words that caused me uh, great grief all my life, obese and obey. I just, you know, both of them started with OB, and I, I just, it's surprising I didn't become an OBGYN, but I just hated <laughs> those words. I hated them. And so, you know, we are called right here in this verse so you must live as God's obedient children. We're called to obey because obedient parents produce obedient children. And you know, the sins of the father literally are passed on to the next generation. You know, in the past few years, I think the past five years, they have discovered that, you know, we have these genetic markers and that if you had a, a line of, uh, of, of uh, heritage and everybody was thin. But if you inherited that, no predisposition to overeating, but you were gluttonous and you became morbidly obese before you had children, you would flip the genetic marker. It has nothing to do with what came before you and you would then pass on that genetic predisposition to your children. Fascinating stuff. I mean, it's just another example of science proving the Bible to be true. Now think about this, where it says, you know, you pass the next generation, but the righteous thousand generations to come. Think about when you, uh, you know, you have a background of ax murderers and you decide that you're going to come to Jesus before you have children. You flip the ax murderer genetic predisposition to no ax murderers, no axes, no murders. I mean, that's what you can do and that will be passed down for generations to come. So we really do, what we do 
matters in the area of obedience. Adam Sandler was doing a record and it was full of off-color stuff and he said, man, I hope my child never hears this. Well, you know what? Every child is putting together their own record and they're playing that thing over and over again. And they see what kind of life we're living and what we need to show them is obedience. Uh, there's a, a movie that was out, Chariots of Fire. Wonderful movie. You should see it, download it, whatever, uh, if you've never seen it. But it's the story of this amazing athlete, Eric Liddell, uh, and his, you know, he was a, a great Olympian, but he was also a man of, of deep, deep faith. And I so admire uh, all that he did and the choices he made to put his faith first. But he said this, and I think it's really important. He said, one word stands out from all others as the key to knowing God. One word, to knowing God. Here's the word, to knowing God. And having his peace and assurance in your life. And that word is obedience. We, we just have to obey and ask God to help us have the strength to do it. Albert Schweitzer said, example is not the main thing in influencing others. It is the only thing in influencing others. And if Albert Schweitzer said it, I mean, it's got to be real. All right, number five, avoid the failures of the past. And so it says here, don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. See, here's what happened. You have this change point. You decide to do a bunch of things differently in your life. And then your sick mind convinces your sick mind that it's not sick anymore. And you don't have to do all this stuff. So you get complacent. Once you stop doing all the stuff that was so good for you, you get confused. Did I really have that bad a problem? Could I just take one little drink and maybe it wouldn't hurt me, you get confused. And then you start to compromise and set yourself up for failure. Finally, the catastrophe happens. You see, the relapse or the slipping back occurred in the complacency, not when you drank again. It was the complacency, not when you ended up 50 pounds heavier again. So if we could intervene on ourselves or somebody living with us would say to us, hey, this week you didn't do what you did last week. And if you want to have another week like you had last week, you better get back on that regimen, that schedule, those habits that you had been using. Because if we don't, we're going to slip back into the old ways. We need connection. We need accountability. We need to today, uh, every day surrender. And when we stop doing that, that's when we get in trouble. Okay. Number six, live like a person set apart from evil. Verse 15 and 16 say, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. God's standard for our behavior is not doing better than you used to be. God's standard is not doing better than your neighbor or somebody else. God's standard is holiness. Now, what does that mean? That means living separate, living set apart, living differently than other people. Uh, another old movie, My Cousin Vinny, hilarious movie. And uh, Vinny and the woman he was with, whatever she was, they go to this little town, and they had a hard time blending in with the town. They were from New York. Well, holy doesn't blend very well because you're living up to a different standard than everybody else. Um, you know, you're not detached, but you're not brought down to the level of everybody else. So live set apart. Now, number seven says live in reverent fear of God. This is an interesting concept here. I'll read the whole passage. Verse 17, and remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. You must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. Number 18, 
For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Verse 20, God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but he has now revealed him to you in these days. So here is this interesting passage of fear of God and a reminder that he sent his son to save us. This this thing that is so above us that we should be reverently afraid of him and reminded Jesus died on a cross for those sins. That's an amazing combination. Uh, The Bible scholar Easton wrote, it is a fear conjoined with love and hope. That's what reverent fear is. Fear with love and hope. And is therefore not a slavish fear, but a filial fear of and reverence. So we have these standards and we have an answer when we don't meet the standard. It's very much like a true story I heard uh, last week. A man, very successful man, in a huge corporation employed his son. And one day he was walking and he sees his son berating an employee, treating him like dirt. So he asked his son to come into his office. And he said, son, you know, um, I have two roles with you. I wear two hats. I wear the boss hat and I wear the dad hat. Right now, uh, here in my office, I want to put on the boss hat. You're fired. I want you to get your stuff and get out of here because nobody treats my employees like you do. Now, I'd like to put on my father hat. Ooh, lost your job? Wow, man, I, let, me, <laughs> let me help you. I want, I want you to learn from this. I, I want, let's find a great job that you can really excel in. Now, that's just kind of the way God is with us. There's a standard, and we blow it, and he's helping us look for the blessings in our life after that. I just love that story uh, because it's one of the few that other speakers tell that is true. So I love that. (laughs) Now, focus your mind on Christ. That's number eight. We go to verse 21. Through Christ you have come to trust God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Now, if you're focused on Christ, you're not focused on your neighbor, your neighbor's wife, You're not focused on the material things of the world. You're not focused on pornography. You're not focused on self-gratification when you're focused on Christ. If you're in a relationship, uh, this uh, seven-minute marriage solution book that I just put out, seven minutes, you reboot the relationship. You focus on what Jesus is doing in your life, what God is doing. For seven minutes, you read a little scripture, you pray together, you come together, check in with each other, And so then you're not so focused on what you didn't get yesterday, the resentments, the bitterness, all that. It's a redo of your relationship every morning because we want to be focused on Christ, not what we think we deserve or what we demand. So focus our minds on Christ. And then it says, you have what it takes to sincerely love others. Verse 22, you were cleansed from your sins When you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. We want to have a whole heart. You may be damaged or broken. You may be hurt. But you can develop a wholehearted love for other people. And if you don't have that love, then you need to ask why. Because, you know, when you truly uh, live a life set apart, it's powered by the Holy Spirit. And and when it's powered by the Holy Spirit, you ought to be seeing fruits of the Spirit in your life. And if you're not seeing those fruits, then obviously there's a problem. But we want to love each other wholeheartedly. Yesterday, my bonus son, uh, Carter, and I were talking to Solomon, and Solomon gave me this amazing gift. He loves dogs. He's six years old, and he loves dinosaurs. That's just normal. He said that if I put him in a rocket ship with a hundred dogs of his choice and it went to Mars where dinosaurs were living, 
he would choose being me with me over that rocket ride. Unbelievable. Well, it got better. He said that if he could live in Disneyland and ride any ride for free anytime he wanted to for the rest of his life, he would still choose me. And I am just walking around there like, man, I have got this down. <laughs> 30 minutes later, he says, Dad, could I have another treat? I said, Solomon, you've had a lot of, he loves candy. I said, you've had a lot of treats today, and I just think you're, uh, you, you're done for the day as far as candy and sugar goes. These are his exact words. Dad, I don't want to hurt your feelings, <laughs> but it's times like these that make me love you less. Oh, man, I had 30 minutes of really great experience there. But isn't that what we do with God? Oh, God, I love you. Oh, I can't have that. Oh, you took that away from me. Uh, you know, God, I'm really kind of questioning whether you exist now because you didn't heal that, fix that. You let me get into this relationship, whatever it is. So we need wholehearted love for each other, too. We need to love each other even when somebody really messes us up. Even when somebody becomes our enemy, we need to find a way to love that other person wholeheartedly. Okay, so here's the prescription for the disciplined life. Here it is, five things. A commitment is always better than good intentions. Mary Crowley, this successful businesswoman in Dallas, Texas said, give me one person with commitment rather than a hundred with interest. Doesn't that make sense? If you want to live a disciplined life, first you got to make the commitment. You got to say, I want to do that. I want to make some decisions I don't necessarily feel really good about making so that I can live the life God has called me to live. Second thing, a plan that works for you is better than a plan that works for somebody else. You know, we're just not wired the same way. And if you exercise three days a week, that may be the equivalent of somebody else doing it seven days a week. Three days a week, is that, that can be the discipline life. You shouldn't feel bad about it. Someone in our family was, um, was possessed by the demon of infomercial. And, uh, this is a, and they ordered that PX90 fitness system. <laughs> And so they started doing it, and, 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 and my wife was doing it, and Solomon, and they're all doing it. So, you know, I want to join the crowd there. Well, I discovered why it's called PX90. I felt like I was 90. <laughs> it just isn't my deal. You know, I lift a little weights. I, I'm on the treadmill, or I'm out jogging or biking. That's my deal. They can have all the P and the X that they want. It's just not for me. So I shouldn't feel bad about that. I should continue to do the things that I do. And then this is, this is the most profound thing you'll hear all day. And this is what you expect from me, this level of profound wisdom. <laughs> when you repeatedly fail at doing it alone, stop doing it alone. And that, I mean, that's just, wow. I just am so proud that I came up with that. You see, self-help isn't really self-help. It's God help. It's group help. It's other help. That's what self-help really is all about. And you know, some people, they're, they're just an exercise partner away from success. You know, in the winter, if you've got an exercise partner and you're gonna meet that person at the mall to walk that mall, it just gives you that extra little motivation. Get up out of the bed rather than just lay there because somebody's counting on you. You know, some people, they... They, you know, they wouldn't be caught dead in an AA meeting or a life recovery meeting. We've got recovery meetings for sex addicts, for uh, alcohol, for the enablers and codependency. I, I've seen guys that have lost their family, uh, their dog. They, they've lost their job, their business. And you ask them, what are you doing to turn this thing around? Oh, boy, I'm, uh, I'm reading my Bible, and God is revealing, and I am praying every day. You know, I believe in reading the Bible, and I believe in praying every day, but all that is is you relying on your resources to get better. 
And if you've failed at that for 20 years, maybe it's time to say, hmm, maybe I need to quit saying that's not for me, and maybe I need to say that's exactly for me. Okay, so when we repeatedly fail at something alone, decide to not do it alone. And then, number four, propensity and proximity leave your life empty. Propensity. We all have a propensity towards something that isn't healthy. For some people, it's food. Some, it's alcohol. Some, it, it's gossip. Uh, some, it's anorexia, cutting, whatever it is. We're driven to that unlike what other people are driven to. Now, when you take that propensity and put it in proximity with the temptation, you got the disaster. When that person over there looks awfully attracted to you, and the restrooms are over here, and you take this route because you're attracted to that person, you're getting in proximity of the thing you have the propensity to sin with. So we've got to set some boundaries and limit our behavior and what we do and where we go. And, you know, the Bible's so great on this. What do you do when you're tempted? You don't go by the workplace. You flee you get out of proximity of that thing. You just run. You don't try to analyze, reason, talk it out. I've had people say, should I call and break it off with this person that is married and has seven children? <laughs> no. No, you shouldn't call and break it off. You just should change your phone number and you should never have contact with that person again until you write his wife a letter saying, I'm so sorry I tried to steal your husband and I'm trying to make restitution for you. Job 51.1 said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look upon the young women, young virgins of the day. So he wasn't going to be sexually stimulated by all those women that were there because he didn't want to sin. He was faithful to his wife, so he looked forward. He refused to look to the right or look to the left. That's what we need to be doing. Get out of sight of the things that are most tempting to us. And then finally, number five, change your mind and you change your life. So you change your mind. Back to Romans 12 too. You transform by changing the way that you think. Now it's easy to talk and think about other people, but think about some things that you think that have kept you right where you are and challenge those thoughts. Change your mind and you change your life. And a lot of people are dug in to some things that if they would change that, everything would be different. One of the greatest uh, actors ever was Henry Fonda. I loved his movies. A lot of people don't know him from any other movie than On Golden Pond. It, once again, it's an older movie. Guys my age, we remember things like that. Henry Fonda was in an interview, and he was asked, what is the most profound memory that you have that changed your life, that had the biggest impact on your life? He told the story of having a Midwestern father who really questioned him becoming an actor. In fact, he was quite disgusted with his boy wanting to be an actor. He kind of questioned who he was as a man if that was going to be his profession. Typical of a Midwestern father back in those days. Well, Henry got a part in the high school play. And so um, came the day of the play, and his father had been so disappointed when he got the part. He was going to stand in front of people and maybe show them he was kind of less than a real man. Henry's mother and sister convinced this dad to go to the play. And begrudgingly, he walked out the door and watched Henry Fonda's first acting performance. They returned home before Henry did, and then when Henry walked in the door, there was the father sitting in his chair, hidden behind a newspaper. He heard the door open and shut. He knew Henry was there, but he didn't remove his newspaper. The mother and the sister were involved in a conversation that became a big argument over some of the parts of the play that weren't produced properly. 
They knew the play, and they knew it could have been different, and they were arguing over this stuff, and it became a rather intense argument. So here's Henry standing there. They're arguing. They don't notice him, and there's Dad behind the newspaper. And all of a sudden, they hear from behind that newspaper, shut up. He was perfect. And Henry Fonda said, that changed my life because I had the confidence of a father who had changed his mind and it changed my life. Our kids need us to change some things that we think and believe about them. Change the way we think and we can change our life to a disciplined life where living holy isn't second nature. It is our nature to live set apart, different, and distinct. So, wrapping up here on this Father's Day, after you've put away the gifts back in the back of the closet so people will forget they gave them to you and you won't have to wear them, long after that, maybe 6, 16, 13, today, you could look back and say, hey, that's when my life started to transform because I started to change the way I was thinking. And that's when I became a more disciplined person, honoring God with my choices. I'll leave you with this. Self-discipline and being disciplined requires choices you don't want to make so you can become the person you always wanted to become, the person God created you to be. Self-disciplined living. You make choices you don't really want to make. They're not fun. They're not comfortable. They're hard. So that you can be the person that you always wanted to be, the person God created you to be. I pray that discipline will come into your life if it's not there. And if it's all about discipline, I pray that gentleness would undergird all of that firmness. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for this wonderful day to honor fathers. I know it's a tough day for some people, and I pray for them, and I pray your grace upon them. Uh, Lord, thank you for this grace-filled church where the thinking has been changed, where there is no shame of admitting, hey, I've got a problem. I need some help. I need to change. Thank you for the leadership of this church that brings us to this point, Lord. We love you. We honor you today as we honor fathers. You are our Father, Lord. And every day should be Father's Day to you. In your name we pray. Amen.